this whole use of the global to the local and thinking about, you know, we had an early warning of Storm Desmond about five days ahead. We were prepared from the global model to see that something serious was likely to happen. And as we got nearer, we could actually pinpoint where something serious would happen. Next slide, please. Um, and we can take that capability that I've just shown you for Storm Desmond and use it to look at future climate risk. And this is an example from some work that we published in the Met Office over three years ago now, which is taking that fine scale model and seeing what it tells us about heavy, in this case, hourly rainfall, the upper 5%. And this is where we get these very intense bursts of rainfall that tend to cause flash flooding. And what we can see on this figure is that on the left-hand column, you've got the current capability where the grid resolution of the sorts of models that we use for climate change risk assessment are sort of at the 12-kilometer scale. And now the future capability, exploiting our kilometer scale capability from weather forecasting, but now within the climate change context. And without going through this in great detail, we can see that if we look at summer in particular, um, if we could just click on the slide, please, that in summer in particular, the chances of a really quite significant increase in heavy hourly rainfall rates, the grey areas, are not there at all in the lower resolution model. And we understand why that the physics of the storm systems that produce very intense rainfall in summer is not just about warmer air holding more water. It's about actually the whole circulation spinning up and feeding these systems with more water. So we, what this tells us is that we can expect actually far more extreme uh, short-term the summer rainfall events in a warming climate than we had expected hitherto by looking at a lower resolution model. This is a really important result because it tells us that we must design our drain systems and our flood defences and our, our urban environments to cope with these heavy summer downpours, much heavier than we had previously anticipated from what the science could tell us. And when we look at the, um, the new UK climate um, pr predictions, projection, projections that will be published next year in, in, uh, by the UK government, they will include assessments from this kilometre scale model. It's a wonderful example of seamless science from local weather forecasting now to local impacts of climate change, which will guide our adaptation decisions in the coming years. Next slide, please. Of course, as I've said, if we look across prediction across time scales, we don't just do the weather anymore. We actually predict on the seasonal and even out to the decadal time scale. And a lot of people ask me, well, if you can't forecast the weather more than a week ahead, how on earth can you predict the climate? And the answer is, of course, that here we're exploiting the external forcing, which might be the sun or the volcano, or even greenhouse gas increases, and we're exploiting the memory in the system, which lies particularly within the ocean and the ocean circulations. So I think, as I've often said, it's not possible in these predictions to say what the weather will be like at any particular place on any particular day, but it should be possible to say what the statistics of the weather might be over the coming season or decades. And that is incredibly valuable information if you're a contingency planner or if you're a, thinking about long-term infrastructure. And this example here just really emphasizes the massive progress we've made in the last decade in seasonal forecasting, particularly for Northwest Europe and the UK and Ireland, and in something that we call the North Atlantic Oscillation that decides whether our winter will be mild and wet or cold and dry. And round the side of the diagram are all the factors that we have now learned through scientific research and experimentation um, and analysis of data that influence what sort of winter we'll have. 
Um, and those are things like the 11 year solar cycle, the state of the Arctic, uh, the uh, El Nino, for example, in the Pacific Ocean, and so on. And so, you know, we are beginning to actually extract real skill. And if you just click on, um, you can see that, that actually for the winter 2015-16, where we had these very devastating floods, we were already saying in, in the autumn that risks of spells of windy or even stormy weather is expected to be greater than usual for the time of year. So contingency planners can use this information. They can get ready to make sure they have the resources to help people in flooded areas. So this is a very exciting development. There's a long way to go, but actually these seasonal forecasts will become more valuable than ever as time goes by. Next slide, please. Um, I want to just introduce something that actually is really quite different, and it's about, again, assessing risk. And here I have just said, surprised again, is this climate change. We had two winters, the Thames in uh, early 2014, a, a huge amount of flooding, and the Thames barrier was raised more times than it was not raised. And then here in the Lake District in 2015, unprecedented amounts of rainfall. And of course, everybody says, well, is this climate change? What we did in the Met Office was to really, next slide please, to take advantage of the fact that we have very large sets of simulations. So we know, going back to the famous quote by Ed Lorenz on the essence of chaos, that one flap of a seagull's wings may forever change the course of the weather. That, of course, is the basis of ensemble forecasting, um, but it also tells us that actually there are many paths that the world's weather could have taken over the past years and decades. But observations are just one plausible realisation of that path, because, as it says, the flap of a seagull's wings could forever change the course of the weather. So something that we say have done to the landscape could have changed the course of the weather that the, the planet has decided to take. So this is a very interesting concept because it just says that actually observations are insufficient to tell you what could plausibly have happened over the last 30 or 40 years, for example. And so we ask, can we use multiple realizations of our weather from our simulations to find plausible alternatives with even more extreme rainfall? We call them black swans. Um, and this is a very interesting concept because when we think about extremes and observations, we have very, very few samples because they're extremes. And so how do we know what the percentage chance is of seeing an extreme in the future or even next year. So if we go on to the next slide, we can see here how we've used this concept to look for black swan events for today. This was actually work we did for the National Flood Resilience Review. And what we can see on this diagram is that for each month um, of winter, October to March, We've got two distributions of uh, dots here, and the black ones are from observations, 35 winters that we have that we consider to be representative of the current state of the climate with the current forcing from greenhouse gases. This is important. We need to make sure that we're looking at something that's relevant for today. And we can see, you know, they're quite widely spread each month. We have a very variable climate, and there are some extreme rainfall amounts. And if we could click, please, we can see um, there's the January 2015 Thames flooding in southeast England. Um, and I think it probably should be 14, actually, but I beg your pardon. But we can see how much of an outlier that was and why it was question was, what is this climate change? Well, we can then take a whole thousand, fourteen hundred of our simulated winters from our climate model being forced in exactly the same way and look at what that model says the distribution of rainfall could be for the same 
external forcing that the real world experienced. And in this case, you can see that it's a much wider distribution. And what I've highlighted here in the filled in red dots is where you have extremes from the simulation that exceed those in observations. And so we can see that actually the January 10 flooding um, was, was actually quite an extreme event that could have been anticipated from the spread of the uh, simulated events. And likewise, in other months, we can find actually quite a large number of simulated events that are more extreme than anything we've observed. And what the models allow us to do is basically, as the insurers say, fatten up the tails of the distribution. They enable us to look with more confidence at the extreme end of the distribution. If we could just click on, please. And from this diagram, we were able to say that on average, there is a 10% risk of unprecedented rainfall in any winter in any one region of the UK. And we divided the UK up into six regions in this particular instance. And there is a 1% risk of exceeding the observed monthly maximum rainfall by 15 to 35% for each winter. So here we're beginning to quantify the risk, not from climate change, but actually just from the natural variability of our weather and climate. And I think that's really important because as we look forward in the next maybe two decades or three decades, a lot of what we will experience as extreme and high impact weather will be because of the natural variability of the weather and climate, just because of where we sit within the climate system. This has obviously generated a huge amount of interest in the insurance and reinsurance sector, but I think it is also really important for us as scientists and for contingency planners, for governments, for local authorities, to actually be aware that that these things are possible even without climate change and that we need to plan for them. So this is a really exciting development and I think will shape a lot of how we do risk assessment in the future. Next slide, please. The other area, of course, where there's been remarkable development is, is the building of models of the full Earth system to look not just at the physical aspects of the weather, the temperature, the rainfall, and so forth, and the winds, but actually to look at other aspects of our, our, our environment, about pollution, about chemistry and aerosols, about how we manage the terrestrial carbon cycle, where does all our water go through the river systems and out to the sea, and what comes out in our rivers and into the sea? How does the ocean biosphere interact uh, with the atmosphere, with the warming world, and so on. And again, this has been a very, very exciting development, and we're beginning to learn a lot of new things about the Earth system. Uh, next slide, please. So when we look, and here's just one example from new work that will go into the sixth assessment report of the IPCC, these Earth system models are now giving us really good ideas of additional feedbacks that may limit our allowable carbon budget. Paris set the goal to stay within two degrees C and possibly even within one and a half degrees C. We need to know how our system feedbacks may have new ones that we have, have yet to quantify may affect the, our allowable carbon budgets going forward to meet those targets. And here's just Two examples where using an Earth system model, uh, we've been able to get a, a, a much better handle on how much carbon emissions we might expect from melting permafrost, uh, how much uh, the nitrogen cycle may limit the efficacy of the carbon cycle, the ability of the terrestrial biosphere to take up carbon. And these these two examples are telling us that actually we have far less room to manoeuvre in terms of allowable carbon budgets than we thought even three or four years ago. So this is also really exciting. But next slide, please. But we can also 
think about how can we use our understanding of the fully coupled Earth system to think about our local environment as a fully coupled system. And over the last three or four years, um, at my time at the Met Office, I started a new initiative to build an integrated coupled environmental prediction system for the UK at the convective scale, at the kilometre scale. Because we live in the local environment and actually being able to predict how that coupled environment will evolve, both in the short term and in the longer term, has huge relevance to people in ecosystems and infrastructure. Next slide, please. So we have built over the last few years a prototype UK coupled system at the kilometre scale uh, as a collaboration uh, between the Met Office and uh, the Natural Environment Research Council's um, centres, um, a really exciting new model to explore how coupled processes within the local environment affect our, us and how our local weather evolves. So we've coupled an atmosphere, land surface, ocean, sediments, and so on, as you can see here in this schematic, and are beginning to understand some really interesting facets of our local environment, particularly around our shores, where we have large tides, we have big waves, we have strong winds, uh, we have issues with air pollution, and so on and so forth. And here's, if we could have the next slide, an example from this kilometer scale coast and ocean model that has been developed. The first figure just shows that how well the uh, kilometer scale ocean model is capturing the distribution of sea surface temperatures around our shores, and in fact, in many cases, giving us even more detail, I would say, than the satellite imagery. If we could click on. The model has also a very good representation of the tides that propagate around our coasts. This is hugely important when we think about uh, storm surges and for the UK at least, the highest risk on our risk, national risk register from the environment is East Coast storm surge, the combination of wind, wave and tides. Um, so if we look at the click on to final time, what we can see here is what the model is now giving us as the sea surface height. And we can see here the tides propagating around our shores and up through the Irish Sea. When we combine that with um, the atmospheric winds and with the wave models, we can actually get a very, very um, enhanced assessment of the risk of storm surge and therefore coastal inundation. So this is a really exciting development. This is the future. Um, this model, I think, will be a decade before we can use it operationally. But it's the sort of thing I think we have to think about. And it will help us build that seamless system from the weather to the decision-making, to the risk and the decision-making that I showed earlier in the talk. So next slide, please. I wanted to conclude, really, with... Um, the history, really. This is the Royal Charter Storm uh, on the 26th of October 1859, so-called because the Royal Charter uh, famous ship was wrecked on the cliffs of Anglesey, along with many other ships. This was a, a very devastating event. And from this came the first shipping forecast, and in two years later, indeed, the first weather forecast. The Met Office was founded. Um, and if we click on to the next slide, we can see a picture of Vice Admiral Robert Fitzroy, who was the founding father of the Met Office. But interestingly enough, he was also captain of the Beagle, and he took Charles Darwin on his momentous voyages around the world, where, from which came the origin of species. But um, on the event of the uh, Royal Charter storm, uh, Robert Fitzroy wrote to the Times, and this is what he said. Man cannot still the raging of the wind, but he can predict it. He cannot appease the storm, but he can escape its violence. And if all the appliances available for the salvation of life were but properly employed, the effects of these awful visitations might be wonderfully mitigated. <laughs> 
I think 150 years on, more than 150 years on, uh, his words speak across the years to us because everything that I've talked about today is about how we predict not just our weather in the next few hours, but long-term climate change, and allows us, as he said, um, to deploy the appliances available for the salvation of life. Um, so we're entering, I think, a wonderful phase of meteorology, uh, where its relevance touches every aspect of, its, of our lives, and being able to predict the future course of our weather and climate uh, will be, I think, one of the great challenges for the 21st century and one that I hope we can rise to. So thank you very much. I hope you've been able to follow my talk um, as I sit here in my, on my sofa looking out to my garden at Devon. Thank you.